everybody. It's seven o'clock, so we are going to uh, call the meeting to order. Can I have an uh, acceptance of the agenda? Move to accept the agenda. Second. Second. By Mr. Norton. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Um, before we get into the walk-in period, uh, Mr. Harris is not going to be here tonight. He's very, very ill. I don't think he's missed any meetings that I can remember from an illness, so if he, he may sneak in later, but um, that's where we stand there. Um, the next uh, item on the agenda is the walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins this evening? Seeing none, we will move on to item number three. And that is um, Keith, is it Jermai? German? German. Yes. German, thank you. Come on up. Uh, um, Keith is our, our new uh, veterans agent, and uh, the man with him is, is it John Asher? Is that how you pronounce it? Yep. And uh, um, if you guys want to introduce yourself and, and tell your roles and. Sure. Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, my name is Keith German. I'm the, the current veteran service officer in the town of Hingham. And uh, although I'm quite humbled by item three, um, I'm not sure that, that the wording is exactly correct at, at this juncture where we're at right now. And hopefully as I uh, finish my remarks, we, we can all get on the same page with that. Uh, town Administrator, Selectman, and Chairman, it's a pleasure to speak before you this evening. Uh, first, by allowing me to introduce myself through the biography that I submitted to your office yesterday. And secondly, by allowing me to clarify the process of veteran servicing and districting. Uh, I hope that this will dispel any misconceptions that the citizens or veterans may still have. Um, as you know, this past summer, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services mailed out a guide for establishing veteran service districts under Chapter 115, which is a binding directive and it was sent to all 351 municipalities in the Commonwealth. The intent of this guide was to help local officials understand the relevant statutes, regulations, and guidelines for the forma formation of veteran service districts. The guide addresses the applicable laws and uniform standards that municipalities must meet in order to receive approval of the Department of Veteran Services Secretary, Mr. Coleman Nee. So let me be perfectly clear, this is at best a five-step process. Step one, last week, uh, I was informed that this body voted to adopt the intermunicipal agreement, the IMA, with Hingham as it was written. Step two tonight, the Hingham Board of Selectmen will review this same document and likely vote to, to adopt. A favorable vote will move our two towns closer to districting. Step three, which, we, which has not yet occurred, that signed document, the IMA, along with an application letter outlining the district structure, constituent members of the Veterans Service District Board, the number of staff members, and the office hours for the prospective district's main and satellite offices will then be submitted to the Department of Veterans Services. <clears throat> Step four, Secretary Nee and his staff will review the application documents, ensuring their compliance under the current guidelines. They will make recommendations or changes as necessary. The secretary at this point may also reach out to the local veterans population, addressing their questions, comments, or concerns prior to formally signing this agreement. Step five, upon a positive approval of the secretary and written consent, the municipalities will then be involved and may now conduct business as a newly formed district for no more than one year. Under our current IMA, we have agreed to shorten this period, remaining in effect only till the end of this fiscal year, a trial period, if you will. Additionally, either town, by vote of its Board of Selectmen, may terminate this agreement upon written notification 90 days prior to the end of the fiscal year. Realistically, this trial period will last until the 30 March 2012. Any determinations must be made by that date in order to be in compliance with the IMA. So concisely, that means we are going to work as diligently and as efficiently as possible to provide the best service for our veterans over the next several months. We will review current operations, streamline the benefits processing system, ensure full compliance with 108 CMR provide support and outreach, form a Veterans Council in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 115. This will, this will be utilized to serve as a liaison between situate veterans and the Board of Selectmen 
and all other town departments, boards, and committees. It will promote the recognition and observance of all patriotic holidays to include but not limited to Memorial Day, Flag Day, the 4th of July, and Veterans Day. To foster an understanding and appreciation within the town of the achievements, contributions, and sacrifices veterans have made to this community, state, and nation. Massachusetts currently provides some of the most comprehensive benefits in the country. Let us continue this long and proud tradition. Never has support for our veterans been more as important as it is today. Since September 11, 2001, more than 35,000 men and women have returned to the Commonwealth as veterans of the armed services. They have sacrificed and they have served. We should now ensure that they receive the benefits and assistance to which they are entitled. Thank you. Thank you. I already like your attention to details. I was being optimistic. Um, we talked about this at length at our last meeting. Um, we're looking forward to you know this so-called trial period. Um, and um, you can see behind you, we have a very active veterans community. Um, they're very vocal and they're very active and they, um, you know, they're going to find out everything that they, they need and they're going to ask you about it. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're up to the challenge and they'll probably put you to it. Um, any, any comments from the board? Welcome. Welcome yeah. to Situate. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I think, if I may, yes, I think, you know, our, our main focus, our main reason for doing all this is, is to attempt to give more services uh, to, to the veterans, uh, services that they deserve. That, uh, and that's the whole purpose of this. Uh, this whole exercise, if I could put it that way. So we urge you to, and I know you will, I, this is probably an urging that's not necessary, but uh, you know, to do everything you can to make sure every veteran, whether it be a veteran of the uh, Second World War or a veteran of the current conflict, get everything that's coming to them. So that's, that's my thought, thank you. Mr. Mark? Yeah, welcome as well. Um, <clears throat> very nice statement and it seems to me that a lot of the things you're talking about are certainly going to be welcome. I was looking at Conley Ford behind you when you mentioned the Veterans Council because that was something that he in particular brought up at our last meeting and the board certainly supported. So, um, you know, if this sounds good, we certainly understand there's several steps of this process and I appreciate you clearly laying those steps out not only for us but so everybody understood. And. Um, you know, you seem a very upfront gentleman, and your reviews are all very strong, of course. And uh, I think it's just going to be really good getting feedback from our people here in Situate. Obviously, there's some hesitations and concerns about what this all means, because any change is always a little unsettling, even if it's for the better, until we know if it is or not. And, uh, you know, I just ask that, you know, you just keep in touch with everybody. We would like your feedback as well, um, as with Tricia, I'm sure, as to what you think we can do better and how we can work things out. And we want to get feedback from the veterans themselves. And uh, let's, let's keep rolling forward. And uh, really appreciate both you guys coming in and, and giving us this statement. I've, I've really learned a lot already. And a, as you know, we're going through the process of hiring the part-time agent. Well, you know, once all of these, at least the first four steps, get, get right. solidified. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, as Joe mentioned, our hours and our service will already be greater than what we had, um, you know, a month ago. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to good things. Uh, Mr. Archer, UK, I don't know if you had anything to add? Uh, not much. I, I'm basically Keith's doobie. Uh, <laughs> actually, I volunteer, um, pro provided uh, volunteer support to Keith's predecessor, Mike Cunningham, when we were servicing both Hingham and Hull. Uh, so I think, I will continue in that role until the operation gets fully staffed. I'm sure I'm going to be involved in um, helping to facilitate the regionalization, if you will, the creation of the project plan and its uh, implementation. But uh, then Keith's, Keith's the guy that calls the shots, and Great. I'll take orders from him. Great. And I know we're setting up a, a meeting, or have we had a meeting yet with in town? Or are we going to wait for those steps to get solidified first? Um, I think like like that was mentioned tonight, um, we're going to be traveling back to the Hingham Board of Selectmen meeting next um, to give a statement there and, and make them uh, aware of the exact process. Um, and at that time, then we would have both the town administrators uh, formalize those letters, um, send them in to where they have to go at the, uh, the department level, 
and then we'd wait to hear from them. I'm sure at that point, uh, Secretary Nee, who is a local resident, meaning local to our area of the South Shore, he's been following uh, some of the stuff in the paper and press about, um, you know, exactly what's what's been going here on. Um, he had some some concerns, some questions. Um, I know he knows that the veterans have some questions. Um, basically, it's on his watch, so he'll he'll take that in, that time frame into uh, effect. Um, when I mentioned that Veterans Council, um, I've taken the liberty to draft the um, a bylaws that we use. Um, I've changed the document. It's in draft form. I'd like to submit this to you because this is crucial to to this office even getting off the ground. Um, if you're looking to like. Um, Mr. Norton said to service veterans in an increased capacity. The Veterans Council serves as an extenua extenuation of the Veterans Service Officer's position. So regardless of the hours at the present time, which are budgeted in or how we have them worked out in the IMA, standing this office up is paramount. Okay. So if you would, I'd like to pass this right, out. Yeah, you okay. can give it a, to Ms. Donovan or, or just just on that commission, is it a commission that each, thank you, Chief, each town would have, or is it something where you'd have like an overlap between the town, between um, individuals on that? On this, that? this town body, the support of select committee in the town of Hingham, and the moderator make appointments to boards, various boards. I'm not sure how you are set up here. I assume it's the same way. Um, it's pretty well spelled out in here. I can give you some more detail to it. I'll look at it. It wouldn't I cross just lines. No, Hingham's Veterans Council would be <coughs> into Hingham's activities, mainly those parades and, and uh, events that I mentioned, which are germane to that particular town. So, but it also acts as a conduit of um, outreach, basically bringing veterans in, helping veterans. Um, I can remember last year in Hingham one time we had a. Uh, young Iraqi war vet who had returned in October and by December <coughs> had ran out of uh, home heating oil because of his lack of uh, employment. He didn't know his benefits. He didn't know he was eligible for unemployment. Uh, he basically ran through some school money that he was taking and just ran right through that. That went quick. Uh, he hadn't eaten in a few days and he had no oil in his home. And uh, the Veterans Council pulled together. Uh, we have a uh, as you if you see when you look through the document a treasurer position we do collect funds. We have some legislation, maybe you could speak to that, where we collect the funds. Yeah, basically what, what we did, um, the, the process of enrolling a, a vet that comes in, as Keith described, is uh, probably a couple of weeks to get all the paperwork uh, submitted and approved by the Department of Veterans Services. So to improve turnaround when somebody walks in, basically can't answer the question when they last ate and what the temperature is and their, where they're residing. Um, we submitted a, a warrant article and got it approved by town meeting, I guess in 2010, for um, special legislation to enable the uh, creation of a fund, the Veterans in Need Fund, which uh, now is one of the checkoff boxes on the real estate and excise tax bills that get mailed out quarterly. And uh, with two quarters worth of bills, I think we're already up to about three, three to four thousand dollars in donations that um, very carefully are monitored. I mean, it's not cash that's sitting there uh, without the uh, discretion or without the approval of two individuals other than the veteran services officer for disbursement, but it's dispersed in the form of stop and shop cards, it's not cash, it, it would buy the service and then buy, it. Keith has just uh, made arrangements with a local heating oil company where put in $400 so that if somebody walks in, he makes a phone call and that person can get their tank topped up a little bit. So it's, we've, we've done some things that sort of provide a bridge between the immediate need and what the DVS provides under Chapter 115. Well, thank you both for coming in. We look forward to expanding the services, and um, we'll be in touch with the community as, as we hear back from you as we go through those five steps you outlined. Yes, sir. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Mr. Asher, thank you. Okay, I'll be in touch. All right, good job. Okay. We'll move on to item number four which is a common vehicular's license for the Backyard Burger Bar. Hi. How are 
you. Good. All right. Good evening. If you can just say your name and address. Yes, Joan Wilson, 8 Claymore Terrace, Situate. Great. And you're here before us to get a uh, common vehicular license for the, the backyard barbecue. We see a lot of construction going on over there. So, mm -hmm. uh, we, if, when was it, about a month ago maybe? We passed the liquor license? Yes. A month and a half. A month and a half, a month and a half ago? Half. September. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know there was a little question about a patio. I think that whole thing's been resolved. Yes. And um, um, you're going to have a patio that's going to serve food. I guess there's no liquor license out there. Is that what the ABCC said? Mm -hmm. Right. And now you're just looking for a common vehicular license? Yes. Great. Any comments from the board? No. Motion. Motion. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to grant a common vehicular's license for Backyard Burger Bar, 17 New Driftway, Situate, Ma Greenbush, Mass. Second by Mr. Murray. All those in favor? Aye. 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 If, it's unanimous. Uh, before you leave, if you, you have a, an estimated opening date? I'm aiming for December 8th. December 8th. Right? Like the sign. The sign looks nice. Yeah, well, the real one's going to look really Better, nice. Better, I'm sure. But at least people know what's going on. Looks Great. good. All right. Thank you. Well, good luck with, the, with your finalizing the stuff, and we'll see you around the 8th. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Joe. Okay, moving on to number five, um, which is awarding a contract for the, uh, maintenance and dredging. Yep. English. <coughs> hey, Mark. Gentlemen, um, Mark Addison, uh, Citra Harbor Master, and I'm uh, here tonight to request the award of a contract to Coastline Engineering for engineering services um, for a dredging project uh, we hope to have take place in the Inner Harbor this year. It's been a bit of shoaling over at the Situate Marine Park. Uh, so this project is part of our uh, ongoing schedule of maintenance dredging to try to maintain adequate depths in the harbor <coughs> for navigation. Great. Is it, uh, just for us land lovers, shoaling, is that when shoaling the is soil when comes and yeah, fills the? the historic depths are no longer maintained because of sediment buildup. Great. And where is, it, where is the actual dredging going to be? Is it going to be down by the new Maritime Center, or is it? Exactly. Right around the basin of the um, marina in front of the marine park. Great. Um, I have one of, uh, just the only other question I had from reading this is this is an enterprise fund activity. So this is coming from mm -hmm. the Waterways Enterprise Fund Correct. and not the general budget. Correct. Right. Motion? Mm -hmm. Really? Yes, please. This is uh, move the board of selectmen vote to award the contract for the engineering services contract number. 11-HD-19 uh, to Coastline Engineering of Marion, Mass, for total contract price of $29,990. Second. Second by Mr. Murray for the discussion. It's your last chance, Rick. No, it's a great thing, and you know that old saying, when it's going your way, keep your mouth shut. All, right. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Mark. Thank you, gentlemen. When is it going to be done? There's a boat down right now nice near the uh, marina, Mark. Is that part of it, or is that a different? Uh, yeah, with a private, um, the marine, the Millwork Marina is doing some dredging on their own. On their own, um, okay. But that company will be around for a while, so there may be an opportunity there for some uh, savings. We'll have to go through the bidding process and find out. And the um, walkway, it looks like, is that completed? Do you know? I, I, I know the. Um, looks like they put the fencing in and uh, on, the harbor walk. on the harbor walk. It's uh, substantially completed. There is. Um, the railing that you see there is not complete. It's going to be extended on um, both ends of that, so uh, there's still a little bit of work to do, but yeah, substantially completed. And thank you. It really looks very nice. Looks very nice. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Keep up the great work, Mark. Thank you. There you go. Uh, item number six: um, a one-year extension for the golf maintenance contract with the company IGM. Hi, Bob. Hello. How are you? So I'm here to recommend a, a one-year extension for uh, our golf maintenance um, to international golf maintenance uh, out of Florida, our right. existing um, keepers. And Bob Sanderson, golf pro at Widow's Walk, for those uh, who don't recognize him. Um, any I, only, I just had two questions, Bob. Um, when I looked at the contract, I see it was kind of like a gradation. And they're in year three, going to year four, and it's going to stay at the same amount. One of the thoughts, I, I, I thought comments I think you had made was that that I, IGM had pulled back a bit their willingness to take on additional expenditures. And I guess my thought process was, 
are they like saying that they're not going to take on more obligations to try to beautify it, or are they maintaining? I guess the, the thought I had was it's gone up. Uh, the contract says that they can only make in the year next year, I think, another, um, let's see, 71, that's 64, so that's uh, 7,000 7, more. But I, uh, will they continue? I know because they've done some beautiful things. That are, they've improved, like the walkway going in, the, some planners that look nice. So it's kind of like making a curbside appeal, so to speak. Um, but are they saying that they're not going to do any more, <coughs> or what, what exactly? I guess that's what I'm trying to determine. You're talking in the last paragraph, I was yes. saying that yeah. um, you exactly. know, they have made a lot of improvements in the course of their contract in recent years. I, I shouldn't say recent years, but in you know, real recent, being this past year, I think that they had a little less money available for those uh, type of expenses because we have some aging equipment that is, they've been putting some money into. Um, and I know that um, with their last meeting, uh, they, they had commented that they've got a couple of um, pieces of equipment that are kind of coming to the end of their useful life. So I guess they, they uh, put in far more than they would normally put in in a normal year uh, this past year. So I right. think that affected some of the decision making in that. Play, in that of course, area. looked great when I played it. Not that I played it a lot, but it looked good. And I, um, the only other thought I had was, I know that you had suggested that you'll be putting together for the board a kind of like a analysis going forward, a cost analysis, if you will, for whether the town should take it on or whether we we do something. And I think that's a that's a great op a, a good opportunity for us to evaluate it to see given the amount involved. So and a similar thing happened in our in our part of the operation, you know, years ago. I mean, I first came in under a management contract, and and then when the time came, then it, you know, it kind of was a seamless transition. But um, so it's it's certainly worth looking into if um, yeah. you know there could be some savings there. Thank you, Mr. Murray. This is more to Tricia. Um, but while we're on the subject of the golf, when is this paid off? When is the bond or whatever? 2017. 2017. 2017. Yep. Who are we in now? 11? Okay. As long as I've been on the board for six years now, it's always been eight years out. And so I was kind of wondering it's, what's it's going on. It's 2017. I'm we watching it. it. You called it and then we financed it. Okay. So that's right. why it's that's why. longer yeah, but that than was in your head. You called years it. Ago. Yeah. yeah. All right. So 2017. This will be up, yep. be up about a year or two. Um, yeah. Now. Yeah. Bob, a quick question. You mentioned the Thank equipment, you. replacing the equipment. Do we own that equipment or do they own the equipment? We own the equipment. We own it. So they, part of the contract is them replacing our equipment with the money we pay them? Them taking care of our equipment, which they do a very good job of. I mean, our equipment, they, they keep it in very good running order, but as the equipment is aging, then certainly there is, you know, just like an automobile, you're going you're gonna to run into a lot more uh, right. expense repair. So you know, is it, but the money that we pay them in their contract, do they use the money we pay them to buy us a new lawnmower? No. By they, our budget. Right, so how does, how does that impact, you know, this last paragraph concerned me too, how does that impact their continued work to improve the course? They are responsible for the upkeep of our, of our equipment. Right. So therefore, um, as I say, some of the pieces of equipment are getting, you know, I guess they're like six years old and the useful life is usually more like five. Just as I say, so now they have to, you know, they have to keep that equipment running. So certainly, um, you know, there's more breaking down and so on so that they have to, you know, they're using more of their, um, their budget to put money into our equipment, whereas if we replace the equipment, then certainly then, you know, there's going to be a period where they probably won't have much expense towards repairs. Okay, so we're not suggesting that we're going to replace equipment this year. They're just estimating that they're going to have to spend more time repairing equipment. They are suggesting, you know, they would like the town to consider replacing a couple of pieces of equipment. They come every year with what needs to be replaced, right. and as you know, the budget's been tight, and we've postponed other than carts, we haven't bought maintenance equipment. We bought a mower a couple of years, but yeah, yeah. not much. Yeah. Not since I got <coughs> here. Right. So that, that's the thing is that they're spending more time repairing them because we've been tight. And, hmm. you know, hopefully things will look up. But the last two years, most of our departments have been in a position to do a lot of capital. Yeah. I guess, as John pointed out, that paragraph was concerning to me, too. If, if we're making all these strides to improve the course and make it more playable and make the average golfer have a better experience, to stop moving in that direction you know, concerns me. 
it, it wasn't an obvious, it wasn't certainly an obvious thing. It's just that I, I, you know, I just noticed that things seemed a little bit tighter. And, and in talking with the regional manager when he was in town last week, um, you know, he it was the first I heard actually that, um, that these two big pieces of equipment, one being our fairway mower and the other being our uh, mower for the surrounds, um, that both of those were really um, in, in need of replacement as, you know, the sooner the better. Uh, so, you know, that made sense to me, I and mean, they, didn't, they didn't outwardly state that, but I just noticed that it just seemed like things were a little bit tighter this year, and that's understandable after I put two and two together with what he said. John? Just two thoughts on that. One would be if, we, if there is a, a request for capital expenditure for a new mower, fairway, or, or surround, or what have you, then um, obviously that's a cost, but then would we be able to auction off or sell, you know, Presumably, some of the surrounding uh, uh, golf courses might say, "Hey, we'll buy situates because it's six-year useful life, as opposed to maybe whatever they have for ten or something else." So, that could certainly be a savings. The other issue I was going to ask is, how are things going in the fall? It seems like every time I drive by, there seems to be a lot of cars there, which is gr uh, vehicles there. So, it seems like right now, <coughs> aside from some of the rain days, it may be looking good at least for the fall. I know sometimes it's, it's dependent on weather. And then, of course, when the snow hits and then it shuts down completely, um, how would you give the board a, an estimate of how things are going right now, Bob? Well, the activity has been great. I mean, I think I think in the 15 years of our existence, um, the course is in the best shape from start of the season to finish of the season that it's ever been in. Um, it's been outstanding. Um, we have been extremely busy, particularly in the fall, for two reasons. Number one, we've had tremendous weather weekends. Um, and two, uh, the Groupon that we did early in the season, we sold like a little over 3,000. And people just seemed like they weren't redeeming them, weren't redeeming them. And then finally, you know, it's about to expire in a couple weeks. And this fall, we just had a slew of them. So um, unfortunately, the revenue from that side of things isn't that great. So you can have a full parking lot and uh, truth be known, um, you know, the revenue from that, the revenue from one normal round is equivalent to about, um, you know, foursome with Groupon. Now, the good news is that the best time to do your marketing is when the golf course is in great condition. So certainly, if you've got new visitors to the course and the golf course is looking as good as ever, then certainly it's going to increase your chances of getting that person to return. So from that standpoint, I don't think we could be in, in any better hands, but the revenue um, you know, the last couple of months we've done more rounds than year-over-year -year comparisons, but we've done less revenue. So, well, hope, but the group one thing might end up, as you say, you might get you'll never be able to track it, but you might get the benefit of that next year or even the year after. Spring, right? you know, that's when it will hit. Because if they come back for it, they'll come back in the spring to get it yeah. to play for the year. So we'll get the it back. Two, the the classic loss leader. Yeah, the two good things about the Groupon is, number one, there's no upfront advertising expense. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, number two, you, you're going to, you know, you're going to get a whole bunch of new people coming in. And, and as they say, I mean, no better time to market when the, when the, you know, when the golf course is looking at its best. Um, so hopefully, you know, hopefully it will pay off and, and we will indeed get the, uh, the return visitors that uh, we're hoping for out of the program. Well, yeah, I mean, as we all know, at the town meeting, <coughs> we just moved the last of the retained earnings to the revenue. So, you know, we need to find some sort of revenue source to, to ebb the, the flow that we've kind of been in. And, so. and, and you know, across the country, we're, you know, everyone's pretty much in the same boat. And um, I think that um, discounting has gotten a little out of hand. And, and it's, um, it, it, it's, to be quite honest, we, it, it, the country has already said that you know, we have less rounds of golf out there. Hmm. And now with people doing these panic discounting and everyone kind of, you know, cutting each other's throat with discounts, um, if we're getting less dollars per round, I mean, that is a, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, I'm trying to actually bring that, bring that forth with um, the New England PGA and try to get some discussion because if it continues, nobody's gonna be happy. Um, that's one of the reasons why I, I suggested that maybe we would look at taking over the maintenance contract because, you know, if maybe we can save $50,000 there, at least, um, you know, it's going to help the bottom line 
and sometimes it might be easier to, to save some money there than it is to pick up the revenue on the other end. Yeah. Well, I, I'd be interested, as John mentioned, when you do that cost-benefit analysis of your ideas in terms of next year, how we're going to deal with the revenue issues as well in terms of marketing and, mm -hmm. and cost reduction. Mm -hmm. no oh, okay. Can I have a motion? Sure. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to uh, <coughs> extend the contract with International Golf Management, Inc., for calendar year 2012 <coughs> for a contract price of $462,659. Second. Second by Mr. Norton. All in favor? Aye. 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 Bob, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Move on to item number seven, which is a uh, report from the uh, Cable TV Committee. Good evening. Thank you for meeting with us, by the way. You're welcome. We're See kind you again, of a Monty. Disparate group. <laughs> if you word? if you want to just take a second, I mean, I know I was on this committee for a while when we did all the negotiations uh, with uh, with Comcast and what have you. Um, so you've done quite a lot of work up to this point. But if you just want to introduce yourself, so yeah, that I'm just going to go around the table. Uh, well, introduce yourselves. <laughs> I'm Monty Newman. I'm the vice. What am I? I'm the chairman. Chairperson. <laughs> Yeah. I'm John Roser. I'm the executive director of Citroen Community Television. Thank you, Katie, member. We've got a, a really a good group here. And uh, Patricia is also on the committee, but she doesn't always attend our meetings. <laughs> but we've talked to her about that. And uh, Rick, you're our liaison to the Board of Selectmen. And I don't always attend your meetings and either. You don't <laughs> talk to me about <laughs> that too. You're in Buenos Aires. We, uh, we're working uh, on it. We have a lot to cover tonight, but we're going to try to cut to the chase. And, and I know you've, you've all received packets from me summarizing a lot of material, probably more material than, than you needed right now. But um, I think what we'd like to accomplish tonight, we want to give you a sense of the state of the state right now in cable television here in Situate. We want to seek your approval to form SCTV as a nonprofit organization. And then we want to review some of, some of our n immediate needs going forward, including this, the room that we're in right now. Um, the cameras, the audiovisual system, the switcher is from, I think it came over in the Mayflower, but I'm not sure of that. And it needs to be replaced, but we'll get to that shortly after we go through the other. And I'm going to turn it over to John now to give you kind of a state of the state of where we are now. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll read a little bit from this prepared, and then <coughs> I just have a couple other comments as well. Um, SCTV is currently experiencing the following level of activity. At Situate High School, there are currently 16 students in the public speaking and TV class that utilize the TV studio, <coughs> excuse me, and SCTV resources on a regular basis. Um, there are also a number of student shows in production uh, involving many students at various times. You might have seen exactly. the um, There are also students and faculty um, creating public service announcements and individual projects, music related videos, and after school programs as well. Um, I was actually at school today helping some students. So. Um, there's a lot going on at the school, and I work very much in, in step with the administration there and Dr. Martin, um, and it has been very good. We've, we've really made a lot of progress over there. Um, and the studio looks great, too. Uh, it's moving along. So in terms of the community, um, over the last two years, uh, there have been dozens of requests by a diverse group of community members for information about SCTV and the use of our studio resources. Um, merchants, the Council on Aging, uh, the Rec Department, the Historical Society, vendors um, have contacted us um, for help in promoting their committees, boards, and businesses. <coughs> there are also, at a minimum, a few dozen parents of children in the Situate School System who express interest in becoming involved with cable TV. Um, committee member Kathy Bullock's town anniversary project has involved many citizens in the historical society in developing a program for SCTV tracing Situate Swiss history for our town's 375th anniversary year. Um, we're also creating a promo video for Pier 44, um, high, 
highlighting some activity over there, which I think is a good idea, and that's almost done. Um, and I'm actually working with the Harbor Master um, to create a, a video promoting Situate. Um, he uh, took us out on a boat, and we got to do some filming in the harbor, and it was just great. I mean, it was it, it was just very uh, generous of him for his time, and I thought um, we got some great footage. So. We're, we're doing a lot, a lot's going on. Um, and in terms of volunteers and staff, uh, in addition to the five active members of the Cable Advisory Committee, there are currently two students on our payroll. Um, one of them here tonight, of them is Zach. here helping out right now. Um, providing uh, assistance here, studio um, production assistance, community outreach assistance, they've been invaluable to me. Um, there are also many people from the community who volunteered their support, um, that, and we will be able to accommodate them better as our program grows. Um, it's, I think the other uh, thing I'd like to add is that we, I've, uh, we did a, the initial install for the studio, which gave us cameras in the beginning of a uh, real TV studio, which is now set up at the high school. Um, and the final part of the installation has been this green screen, which I think Mr. Murray got to see briefly. Um, but it's just amazing the technology that um, we're utilizing now and we're, we're, we're just about there we're still positioning the lights for this project but the um, the green screen allows basically anyone to be anywhere you know it's really amazing it's like the weather screen on the, <coughs> the news um, it is just amazing the, the technology allows um, any person you can do an interview in Hawaii if you want <laughs> can go really anywhere but it's um, Japan you can do Japan you go to Japan. but um, <laughs> it's just um, it's it's um, it's really exciting it's been um, great for me and it's been great for the program to be in the school and to have people helping and then the technology itself is, is just incredible it's it's this is a new studio so all those things that you think the HD quality the all the tech um, ability online stuff, posting, all that. Um, very exciting. I'm glad to be a part of it. And I, I should, he, he won't say this, but I'll say it, and the committee will back me up on this, won't you? Um, John's done this all himself. I mean, we work on the committee and we kind of help him and we meet monthly and when there's an issue, we go over and try to work on it with him, but John is the one who's done it all himself. And uh, I've, I, as I bridge, I'm, I'm mentioning that only because as I bridge to the not-for-profit uh, request, I've revised the, uh, the charts that you have in your book because I found some typographical errors as well as some content errors, and I will give them to you now. And it's a comparison of what other towns in our area are doing <coughs> here Thanks, in the table of area cable television. Thank you. And I've either visited these towns or I've contacted them by phone, Thank or you. in one couple of cases by email. Um, the bottom line on it <coughs> is, when you look at the various towns, everyone's kind of doing it differently. There's no clear pattern. If there's a model that I think I would like to see Situate follow, but I'm only one person, it would probably be the Hopkinton, I can never can say that, Hopkinton yeah, no model. Up. It's a town about the size of Situate in terms of the number of subscribers. I think they have around 6,000, 7,000 homes. And it's evolved over a number of years to a, a pretty good operation. Um, in fact, one of the programs that they produce, uh, Physicians Focus, yes. actually airs on our system. Very pro. And Very they, pro. they produce this program and provide it to cable systems all over the state, gratis. Um, I'm showing you the numbers because I think before you can make a decision on this, you have to kind of weigh it against what everyone else is doing. Norwell, Cohasset, Hingham are really in the, uh, what I would call the formative stage. We're well ahead of them in terms of where we're going. Uh, we have a real deficiency on the staffing side. It's a one-man band with a high school intern. That's it. And. Uh, I know nothing about technical. I can, I can talk organization until <laughs> the cows come home, but I, I, I don't know squat when it comes to the engineering side of it. That's John. He's done the whole thing. 
uh, and Rich, who's been very helpful from the school. Yes, Rich has been. Um, so w we've got the right people doing it, but we need a little more firepower in this thing, and I think that can come with a not-for-profit organization, um, which is my bridge to not-for-profit. Can you, can you um, just elaborate on that? Why? Why not-for-profit? No, why, why is it going to generate more firepower? Having more people? <coughs> No, no non-for-profit by going transitioning from well, public oh, 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 I got it. to non-for-profit. Um, How are you going to get the revenue sources? Obviously, this is coming from right. the cable, but if right. in order to get that firepower, in, in essence, the, the the person power, how are you going to be able? It would start, what do you foresee? Well, it'll come with what I'm going to present, but it's going to come with staffing. Number one, you can't do it with a one-man band. We will. We will remain as we are now and make gradual progress, but we won't make quantum leaps in terms of the progress that can be made. And I'm not, I'm not talking organizing this like Channel 5 or Channel 4 or one sure. of the local no. television stations. Yeah. It's basically a, a community cable access operation, and I've got a vision statement I've been working on now for months that in terms of what I see it looking like. But it can't be done with one person, and it can't be done in the studio facility we now have. The one we have at the school is excellent, but it's not big enough to handle what will start to happen as more people from the public start to get involved in the system. Um, there has to be meeting space. There has to be more studio space. There has to be more control room space. What we've got there now is great and should stay at the school, and w when we become, if we become a not-for-profit, we would continue to service that need, but we need a larger facility to operate from. Uh, if you'll notice, for example, in Brankview, they have 2,300 square feet. If I could just interrupt, Monty, on, on that Please. subject. Assume that you were able to get the space and you're able to have the, um, I say the machinery, the technology and the you know, items that you need, the equipment, I guess. Right. And you have it, but nobody comes. I, I'm playing devil's advocate no, here because, right. I mean, it's kind of a question here that you get into. <laughs> and it puts us Come in a position record. where I'm like, the vision is clear. I, I like the vision. I like the thought of like, okay, the town has its own uh, community access TV so that people can go there. We've kind of had this in the past three years, you know, thereabouts. And yet, you know, I, I like people who are watching tonight watch Channel 10, and I'm sure the other ones, they'll watch right. Channel 22. Right. 22? 22. 22. Yeah, I mean, we always flip. I'm always checking it out. Then my wife says, get away from your own meetings, you know, and we'll flip it. <laughs> The Stop point I'm trying to it. say is, is that, you know, what we're trying to encourage people to do is not watch our meetings, <laughs> but to come out and create, come out and do different things, have topics, you know, whether it's sports right. or whether it's, you know, um, hobbies or whether it's, you know, historical or something. To date, I haven't seen an awful lot of that. It should be, and I want to see it. Right. But I think the question I run into is, do you put the money in, in, in one, if you're going to be doing a lot of staffing, it's fixed for nonprofit, which means that you're going to pay a lot up front. Two, you're going to have equipment, and then you have it's kind of like you build it. Will they come? And and my thought is is that I'm happy to entertain that. I would hate to see though you build it, you staff it, and then you basically end up nothing having happens. nothing for the because you're going to have to terminate people if nobody's coming and you have an empty room. That's true. That's the fear I have. I I feel like I can feel part of that. I think um, one of the one of the kind of the issues that that's that we've been dealing with is is that it's taken a long time to do the full install of the studio. It's just taken a long time to get everything in there, and so it's really now just getting started. Trisha came over to see. Now it's really kind of kicking in now, where we can actually create top level, you know, pro quality video. Has really just happened in the last month or so. In terms of where we where we're at, um, but I think that what it is is you know I, I had a show on CCTV in Cambridge for a long time, and what the nonprofit, but even that aside, just having um, that community sense, it, it kind of starts building itself. Like once you um, foster that idea of of community and nonprofit, then people come. But it's it is that kind of thing that you. It has to um, be done first. So now the studio is done. Now we can really take a look and see, you know, how who starts to come in. And all these students that are involved now really have the opportunity to branch out, parents, other people. I think it's 
it's right, right right now is where we really have a chance to start to see and what part of it part doing. of it too in, in fairness to John here we've been somewhat reluctant to really market it the way we should because we couldn't handle it if this thing st I think when the town begins to realize the potential of it and what it looks like it, it'll draw more people and just one brief thing I'm, I was dying to present this so I'm going to do it anyway visualize this for a minute when you I visualize Channel 10 as almost must-see TV. When you turn on your television, you turn on Channel 10 first, then you flip to Channel 4 or whatever you're going to watch. This is if you might catch something, except you guys sitting here That's doing when you your flip. meetings. That's <laughs> when you flip. Okay? So the content in a typical programming setup might be situate government, the various meetings. We're starting to tape some of those meetings. Recreation. I mean, the recreation department is, is loaded with content. And the woman over there is dying to get involved. Uh, Situate News. In case of Hopkinton, they have a mini, couple of mini cams running around town catching information that's being broadcast on their station. Or cablecast, right, Tracy? Um, dining and entertainment in the area. What's going on? What new businesses are coming in? Um, the Situate Library. Is it Kathy? Total resource. I mean, that's an enormous resource that we could be tapping into. Local politics, you've got people running for office. Who are they? What are they talking about? What is your representative saying? Uh, what are the selectmen saying? Um, religion, that's a whole separate category. Education, in, in Weymouth, they treat education not as the schools, but as educating the community about things that are going on in their community. So it becomes, it becomes like a, a visual mariner that's ongoing and steady. Uh, based on the communities that are doing it, and I keep coming back to Hopkinton, but I, you could point to Weymouth and a couple of other of these towns, they're getting tremendous feedback. I was over to tour the uh, Weymouth studio a couple of weeks ago, and right in the middle of the tour, the director over there was giving me this tour, and a group of 20 people showed up, and there was no room for them, and they have a pretty good-sized facility. If we had 20 people show up at the high school, forget it. After, after we got them quarried, if we got them in the building, there would be no place for them to go. That doesn't mean it was a mistake going to the high school because it was the only game in town when we needed space. And it should stay there and it can grow, as, as Rich will tell you. And we can help feed that growth that's already starting to occur. I'm running off at the mouth, but I get crazy on the subject, so please. In the 80s, this um, is I Tracy. was the program director for the towns in Norwood and Westwood. And I was lucky enough to have staff of four full-time people. And because we had four full-time people in those towns, we were able to create programming that people in Situate actually saw <coughs> because I used to um, bicycle the pigs down here. And weekly, <coughs> on a weekly basis, we did a show with the Celtics. We did a show, a call-in show with the um, Patriots. I sent a 14-year-old kid to um, Lou Gorman used to let him have, uh, you know, he could do anything he wanted in that uh, Fenway Park, interview players, everything like that. We had a show, um, Larry Glick had a weekly show with us, Charles Laquadera had a weekly show with us, um, Rex Trailer did a show with us. Hmm. There are so many shows that we were able to create for those towns, and you you watched them here in Situate if you were in this town in the 80s because she played them. And that's all because I had a staff. And nobody around me was doing that. The towns of Norwood and Westwood were so smart when they uh, put together their license. They got together, the selectmen got together from each town and said, okay, I'm going to demand a full-time program director and a full-time production technician. You ask for educational access, access coordinator and a local origination coordinator. So we ended up with four full-time people in that town. And we were able to do tremendous things. But it was all because I had people who could teach the staff. If a kid wanted to do a show with um, his friends some afternoon and I wasn't available, I had someone on my staff who could be there and be in the control room with the other kids and show them how to use the cameras. And it was all because of the staffing that we were able to do that. Now, um, Norwood actually had a nonprofit or organization in the 80s. I don't know if that's one of the models you looked at, Monty. But no, I didn't. They no. started one in the 80s where 1% uh, of the gross revenue from the our cable company <coughs> went to the town of Norwood. They established a nonprofit. The first check was $500,000. <coughs> they got themselves going, and they were basically giving grants. But this would actually be them running the, the, the channel. You know, 
you know. So staffing is, is the key to everything. If you don't have the staff, it doesn't matter if they come. You just can't help them. In the case of, that's a good summary. Monty, one second. But here's here's Sorry, my question quick question, and this goes to everybody, including you, Tracy, and that is, okay, I see your vision, all right? The, the question I have, though, is what's the revenue? You're going to be getting a certain amount of revenue source, obviously, through cable. Then when you talk about the staffing, you're talking about the programming, which is great. This is public access, so people come in, they say, fine. Then you're going to have to hire somebody to do what Zach's doing or what John was doing or somebody else. Mm -hmm. Then there comes another point where if you're going to be continuing to do programming to send somebody out, whether it's a camera cam to go out and check out things or whether it's setting up the studio so somebody can come in and put on a PSA, mm -hmm. public service announcement, or uh, politics or religion, right. or, or say, hey, let's sit down and talk about the movies. Right. My point is, what's the source? How is it that you anticipate or project a source of revenue that's going to accommodate right. all of those right. personnel, which from a programming standpoint, if you are Channel 5, Channel 4, Channel 3, 38, yeah, any of these others, Staff they use thousands. the commercials because that's where they get the money to be able to pay for it. Okay. So I got it. that's I got all that. I'm trying to figure out is talking what you're suggesting, which I totally agree with, how do we get there from a monetary standpoint right. without running it into the ground and burning and saying, gee, we that's had the correct. vision, but guess what? That's correct. We just didn't have the money. That's that's where I'm trying to. The overcome. outline that you've just given is going to cost about 120 to 130 thousand dollars a year. The income that comes in annually from and, and doing all of the things you just said, the income that comes in from Comcast is about 200 thousand a year. If you add to that fundraising which some of these systems are doing, uh, following the PBS model, selling advertising, but following the PBS model, there's another 40, 50,000 a year in there. I'm sure of it. I, I did this for a living, so it's the one thing I, <laughs> I feel comfortable with. But you've got to have the programming and the system in place before you can do that. Um, is it going to be a big money maker? No. Is it going to be self-sustaining? No question. Because a lot of the things we're talking about will also involve volunteers. If we had the staff, we could train volunteers to use the mini cams, and they're tiny little things. And we can hire uh, kids like Zach from the high school. Not a big, it's not a big cost. It's a reasonable cost. We cover his hours. He gets paid for doing the meeting tonight. We've got a budget for that. So it's, it sounds bigger than it really is from a cost standpoint. And we'll be working with Tricia to nail down the actual operating budget for the first year of operation for a not-for-profit. We've done preliminaries, but we're not there yet. Thanks. Rick? I think the short answer, I got one quick answer to that, then two, two other stick points I'd like to make, if I could, Mr. Chair. I think the short answer, John, to your question, is that they have $200,000 a year coming in from the cable fees. And that's their budget, and they'd have to stick to that budget until they grow the above, that, until right. they grow above over X right. number of years. But you have to stick to that budget, the under. minimum budget, and all that sort of thing. Um, just as two, two other statements, um, we all see most of our interface with the cable is through Channel 10 and Tuesday nights and, and watching the town meetings early in the morning, which I watch when I'm working out and I watch Channel 22 and all this sort of thing. Um, but I just want to say on behalf of the committee, that there's a tremendous amount of stuff that they've been doing behind the scenes that nobody ever sees, ourselves included, in terms of a lot of the hardware upgrades, some of the processes and procedures they're putting into place that even though they're not there to fruition yet for whatever reason may be, right. there's just, it's a completely different mindset and different system than has been in place for years. And I just really wanted to point that out because they've been doing a lot of work I've been about a third of the meetings. I'm on all the emails and all this sort of stuff. They've been doing a lot of really good work. It's, it's a tremendously different thing. And most of it is behind the scenes that if you're just watching Channel 10 or Channel 22, you don't see. I would like to see, I understand you're taping some of the other committees. I would like to see the other committees broadcast as soon as possible and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. The other thing, though, is about tonight, whether we vote yes or vote no or say we need more information and want to discuss this at a later point, I think we all want the same thing. I mean, the vision that you guys are all talking about and that we're talking about here, we all want to see the community involved. We all want to see town government get out there. We want to see education, 
all aspects of PEG, public education and government. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't want to speak for the board, but we're all, who wouldn't want that? That's right. Right? right. Questions comes down to me, um, and overall I, I generally support the idea mm -hmm. of considering going to a nonprofit, as you know, but like, is now the right time? Some of what I think Mr. Vignani was asking, I think, was uh, we don't have a lot of people now, and you're sort of asking us on faith to say, well, if we put the nonprofit, all of a sudden the floodgates are going to open, we're going to have tons of people coming in, and we'll be able to staff it and work it and all that sort of thing. And that might be true, but you know, I, I'm not sure the average person right now knows whether it's a nonprofit or not. They don't. They might. Right. You know, I, I don't right. think right. that's a filter as to whether someone's getting involved or not right now. Um, oh, but, right. Maybe, but maybe it is. I, I do say they've done a lot of good comparisons. There's been, over the last year, a lot of discussion about what other towns, these folks have gone out and visited other towns and different models and so on. Um, so Didn't charge for, you for gas mileage. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, take that up with Tricia. Um, you know, to me, the issues come down to the, the very good summary um, you know, on your proposal about the pros and cons of going to a nonprofit. And, um, you know, to me. You want me to just pop through that quickly? Uh, they you know, we've all read it. We've so all we read it. So it, let's just, if, if we could, just sort of move on to that. I, mean, I just want to make one quick comment, Rick, but on your, yeah. you know, I think we're making the assumption that all of the cable money is going to go to this project. And that's not necessarily where it has to go. You know, that there's $200,000 that can be used in other other avenues if I... Very limited, though. I'm not there's sure some, of that. There's what some, do you there's, mean? There's, there's, uh, Very limited. What do you um, mean? Fiber optic stuff for the school that oh. they're working on. I mean, there's other areas that it can go on. So, I mean, I think we're just making a big assumption that all of it will go to this budget. Wait, what do you mean? I, I'm serious. I mean, are you saying that we can, we can spend some of that $200,000 for a snowplow? No. No. Okay, so what are you saying? I just, yeah, I just well, want to make sure, I just no, want to make sure people are understanding. There's other uses of that money other than funding a cable, uh, a television studio. Okay, so, so within the context of stuff technology. And, okay. And, uh, in, um, you know, like I said, fiber optic type stuff or other type of networking things that the town may want to do, the school may want to do, sure. okay. is, is available under that money yeah, as well. I just want to make sure it was clear. Yeah. Not, right. not just to buy not things, buy but things. there's if it falls into certain criteria, you can. If it has to do with, um, well, I've got it right here. The state yeah. law requires that any expenditures of cable access funding paid to the town by Comcast or other providers must be cable, TV, or INET related. In the INET in this case refers to networking that delivers video origination and other networking customarily provided by a cable system institutional network. Personally, I don't think computers qualify. Nope. So, Monty, hold I've on been a told that people feel otherwise. I don't even want to go there. Money, hold on just a sec, if I may. Um, so, what it used to be before the system changed. Remember, about three years ago. No, I was on the committee. I'm yeah, well but we, you and I were passing yeah. it back and forth right, about so that time. I, I was doing all the contracts. I'm just saying because it used to there be there are other did. uses of it. This is obviously one of the bigger uses that you can use it for, but right. there are other uses for the money. We're never going to spend 200000 a year to run this thing. It's probably going to be a hundred to hundred and fifty In that range is what our operating cost would be. This budget has to be approved by the administrator, has to be approved by a board of directors. The checks and balances are there. We can't just willy-nilly go spending money like crazy. I'm proposing in the original organization a staff of only three people plus a couple of interns. If you look at some of these systems around the state, they've got a, a, they got a $1.3 million budget in Newton. Give me a break. They've got a staff of 11 or 12 people. In Plymouth, they've got, I don't know how many people, uh, it's in the list, right. and, and here's, the, here's the kicker, and it's something we could be thinking about as a town. They're actually servicing Duxbury, Kingston, and Plymouth they're providing the fees, and they're getting the income from those three towns from Comcast coming into their their kitty, so that in Plymouth they have an uh, they have they have revenue of over a million dollars a year. That's great. An operating budget of about two or three four hundred thousand. So, 
all I'm saying is <laughs> let's think outside the blocks here. Let's try to figure out how we can use this to our advantage as a communications tool for the town on one hand and something that can actually generate money when it's up and running the way it should be. Just so, just so you understand. Sorry, I, I, I no, no, no. To, I just want you to understand because we deal with, uh, obviously, this committee, other committees. Right. I mean, and in many instances, we come in here and we're kind of being the, um, <coughs> um, shall we say, the devil's advocate well, to, to try it. Because the reason why is, right. you know, some people come in and say, oh, this is great. And if we right. jump on board, turns out it falls yeah. flat. Then everybody turns around you and say, Okay, selectman, what did you do wrong here? Right. And then we start well, seeing ourselves in the newspapers I'm and everything else. Dodge when it goes <laughs> My reason for saying it is, is that I see the vision. I think the board sees the vision. The, the, obviously, what we're trying to figure out is okay, if you have $200,000, the cost for equipment, the cost for space, trying to find space that's going to accommodate it because of the town buildings and everything else, right. it's a whole other host of issues. Where are you going to find it? it? It turns into money, which means that if, if we're able to say today, fine, we have the space build out the whole entire downstairs of this building and you got it great you can't do that because the building is in such bad repair to begin with a, you could put you run into all these things 44 it's sitting there and, and you've got all these issues but that's a whole another issue that will come to the <laughs> board another day my point is is that that's the only reason why I raise it because I say okay I don't want it to fail I want to see it succeed and instead of jumping way ahead you take the next step, the logical step. Does it make sense to have a second studio? To be honest with you, these cameras are awful. I look yellow in them when I'm not watching it at home. Look awful. You know, I, if it makes me look thin and younger, I'll be very happy. <laughs> but you know, the reality the is they should be they should be better. So I mean, we can think about that. Would it be the wisest thing to do today or this year to do the studio? Maybe not. Maybe we say instead you fi hire the staff to be able to start promoting or be able to go out and do different things. Or, or lease equipment. Uh, whatever. I'm just, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that I don't think we, um, we're not against it. It's just, we're trying to figure out what's we the best We completely support That's all. it and the vision of it. My whole question here is, how is making it a nonprofit going to get it there? That's as, a, as opposed to? I, as opposed to the way it is now. That's, that's my own question. I read all your, your reasons. None of them were that compelling to me as to why right. that is going to make this blossom into what everybody wants it to be that's the that's the question well yeah and if you have a board of directors you guys are removed from it and they're responsible for the funds that's a big part of it but, but so right now are we, it's not okay so right now it's you our guys are being inhibited by us well yeah. in a good way how, how? Yeah. in a good way but as a town department, it's very difficult to grow something like this. It really is. We, we put together a budget of $113,000 for the current fiscal year. When Trisha and the two and a half got through with it, <laughs> it was it was knocked. We they knocked th thirty thousand out of it. Th something. They knocked the, the part-time person that we wanted to help John out of this budget, which left it all on John's shoulder. To progress. Now, if, you, if you're organized as a not-for-profit, it's like a separate business. You have a budget. You do the whole process the way we know. You have a board of directors, two of whom are appointed by the board of selectmen. So you have a vote there. You have a financial controls person. So there's nothing going amok here. You're setting budgets. You're setting goals. But you have an opportunity also to generate revenue through the underwriting stream that you can't do as a town. Right. It's not that, available to you right. as a town. That was the one, I mean, the one compelling piece. I, I mean, Tricia does a great job running the budgets of a Perfect. whole town. Absolutely. You know, I find it hard to believe that this one little entity of $130,000, $113,000, that all of a sudden that's not being done well. So well, I, that's what that's. It, we, that, they dropped it to 79. From well, there was probably a reason for it. Oh, there was. Yeah, right. So <laughs> We don't have right. any money. <laughs> well, then. You know, no, no we're, we're not complaining. No, no I'm just it saying. to be done. Right. I mean, if, it seems like what wants to happen from this is to take the financial control away from the town and give right. it to a group of people. That's right. That who? Well, it's your board of directors. Right. Well, well right. we haven't come personally right. to your group. Right. Right. You would, you would have two. There would be five on the board of directors. This group would appoint two of them. Ideally, you'd probably have a, a lawyer, <coughs> someone from the uh, okay. finance community. You'd, you'd have a good mixture. That's what they do in the other towns, okay? So you have community leaders 
on this board of directors. You have a financial person on the board of directors. You have a finance person in the structure of the, of the, of the um, organization itself. Um, the controls are enormous, but the decision process is, is lightning fast. And they come forward because they want to be a part of it. That's the thing. It's like those right. people And that's, that's want kind of goes back to what John involved. said a second ago is I don't see how all of a sudden we turn into a nonprofit in 20 minutes and all of a sudden the people come out and say, now I'll get involved. Oh, no, no. It's, it's going to take a to year. To it's like you're, you're empowering people and the citizens who might have an interest who otherwise wouldn't, saying that right. we now have this project, we now have this thing that we can all be contribute to and control and, and, and be a part of. But you, you could, uh, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud, but you have control over it now. All you have to do is when you get when you want to spend money, okay, you got to go through this channel. That's it. No one's no and one's, and that's fine. Right, and and we can operate that way. Right, and I'm not saying we can't. We'll just drive Trisha crazy, <laughs> but that's beside the point. She's only she's only got about 50 other people reporting to her. Um, the big thing is liability. If if you want to keep it as a town, and we start putting programming on this system, and John's got checks and balances, he's got all the liability forms they have to sign off. All it takes is one thing to go on that system. And some of the community members come after you guys because they're going to come to you and they're going to come to Tricia. They're not going to come to me and they're not going to come to John. What you want, you want them going to a not-for-profit because a not-for-profit can tell them, sorry, but that's what we decided to do. If they come to you, you're Monty, sitting, they're you're sitting coming, in liability They're coming to hammer. us anyways, all right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're going to come in this meeting okay. and say it's your television station. And all you do is you turn them away. That's the way the other town. They send them to the board of directors of the not-for-profit. That, that works well. <laughs> if, if you want that <laughs> excitement, that's fine. <laughs> I just, I feel like... What, one second, all right. Mr. Norton. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Tracy. You, just, uh, this is something that, you know, was happening in other towns in the 80s. I feel like we're way behind the cable company gives a percentage of the gross revenue to the town to create local programming. So what you do is you create a nonprofit organization where they can oversee the creation of the um, local programming. The program directors at the cable companies want nothing to do with this. They handed everything to us and said, here you go, here's the money, you do it. Now, I think you guys are too busy. I think we should have people who know what they're doing who can focus on one thing to do the one thing and spend the money the way it's meant to be spent by law. There's certain things that you can do with this money. It's very cut and dry. And it just doesn't make any sense that you'd want to take on. And I know she's not having a day at the beach with all this. <laughs> so <give laughs> she, committee of people she wants to get rid of me. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that difficult. All you these do. towns are doing it. Yes. Mr. Norton. Let me just ask. Uh, and it's obvious there, there, there are pros and cons to this, and, and both both uh, sides, the arguments are great. What's your time frame on this? I mean, when is there a time that this has to be done by uh, in order to be effective? In my mind, I'd love to have an approval tonight. We'll set this thing up. We'll be running by January 1. We'll have the, the, the two or three people hired to re support John. We'll fight with Trisha over studio space. We'll go through the whole process. Second option, what's that? And we'll be cooking. <laughs> yeah. We'll be we'll be selling apples, baby, by <laughs> April. <laughs> Give me another option. Give me a, uh, in order for us to you know, to just digest it. No, you can wait. I mean, there's no. We we were told we had to come to talk to you guys. Oh, I think that's. Uh, I'm that's, trying to come away with a sale. Yep. Uh, yep. Right here is a very detailed document in your packet, which you probably haven't read, except Rick has. On the plane. No, the whole board has read this money. Have they I really? Mean, come on, well, we this, have actually. Well, no, th we've, I'm talking about this thing. Yeah, it's from the one that we all, It was uh, given to us, so you should assume it's all ready. It's legal, so I read it. Let me tell you. Any. There you go. How much, did we, pay, how much did we pay for him to do that? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. <laughs> that was my first. My, for that was what Tricia asked about six months ago. But I got it the price down. I actually got it reduced. <laughs> it's still all right, so, Monty, can you answer Mr. Norton's question, please? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just time-wise, I mean, if, if if you don't get an answer tonight, when would you like to have an answer? Whenever, by? whenever it works for you guys. So there's no, uh, there's no deadline. Absolute deadline. Okay, no, that's, that's my point. Mr. Chair. 
we would like to hire, though. Why don't we just close this up? Because I can feel I'm losing this one. You're not losing anything. No, and no, go, no, don't take it that <laughs> way. No. And go to your needs list because we do. We should talk about the room that we're in right now. Yep. Go ahead, John. Tell them what's wrong with this room. Well, the, and the, the, it's just simply the equipment. Basically, I think it was installed here in '89 or '90 or, or something. And what happens is the, the mechanism that moves these cameras, the motors, um, the switcher. Um, they just eventually burn out and or need to be serviced. And now I think we're down to literally, maybe it's even one camera now, I think. Um, one of the cameras started to go on the blank, but this is something I've, I've kind of um, been petitioning for for a long time. I mean, it's really, it's a very reasonable cost to upgrade a couple of the components here that would allow a much better picture and bring it right into the 21st century. Um, when I first got here, it was still video. So I actually, the first thing I did here as uh, my very first uh, thing was to go digital here. And the board's not working, right? is that building? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it, um, it really, it's, it's relatively short money to, to improve the quality of the picture 100%. 10 to $12,000 to fix this room and make these pictures pop, whether we go not for profit or not, you guys will look a lot better. And you take you can take that out of the budget. I mean, it's a it's it's a cable related INET expense. Hello, you don't have to go to town hall and get a vote from the public. I would recommend you to go ahead and do this. Uh, we there would have. There is a process to request funds over and above See? your budget. See. And this request was given to me by John two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it just it it concerns me a little bit when. The town administrator is, going to tr is trying to control the resource of the town, right. and there's not unity to it. You know that there's a process that has to be fo found, and I don't know that the the way to get around the controls of the financial side of things right. is to say, you know what, we'll just take it away from you. We'll just do it. Just give us the money and let us do what we want. You know, and I think it's at tempting. some <laughs> right. I think at some point in time that may be the place and, and right. as soon as all the things start clicking in place we see the demand we see the programming coming on and you know I don't think a nonprofit is going to fix these things no. I think you need ten thousand no. dollars you go through the process That's right. and if it's a reasonable request it'll get passed but if you don't One have second. the equipment and the manpower or person power to run the basic operation that you've got right now you're not going to get all of those things that you want to get you've got to have some core yeah, things we, that make got it that. work Mr. Murray I think in Everybody one way to move forward here because I do see that everybody here is on the same side and that we have the same end goal in terms of improving services to the town and creating opportunities for more people to get involved in programming, the creation of programming, <coughs> bringing in the schools a lot and all that. I think everybody wants that to happen. But I don't think we're ready to, to uh, you know, approve this, this plan okay. just yet. He here's one way forward that I think would at least be helpful to me is if you, you've given us the outlines of a plan, okay? But I would like to see a more specific sort of rollout with goals that you can realistically achieve, regardless of if it's a nonprofit or it's within the town, but sort of like roughly X percent of the 200,000 or whatever it would be. Mm -hmm. We would propose, as part of the regular budget process for this coming year, that's going to go through town hall review, through Tricia, and through us. Mm -hmm. These are the benchmarks we aim to achieve. We're going to have up now. If you need more staff, you're going to be able to get that staff if it gets approved by people because it's going to be a certain amount of dollars and you're going to have those same amount of dollars or not and I understand there's differences between hiring town employees versus a nonprofit hiring employees and I know those differences are not subtle and there's impact on that so that would be a wrinkle we'd have to step through and mm -hmm. figure out mm -hmm. but still if you hit some benchmarks and you provide us some benchmarks as a plan to evolve towards a nonprofit <coughs> perhaps over the next two years. Mm -hmm. This coming year, taking advantage of the studio, taking advantage of the good work with the schools, taking advantage of, okay, we've got the studio, we've got new cameras, we've got this. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging that you need more people because John can't do it you know, himself, and Zach needs some help, help in the back there yes. as well. Zach's going to Harvard. Right, okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> right, Zach. So, um, and, and give us, a, a cogent plan okay. 
focused on that and I, I don't think we need more of the background material that you provide to bring us up to speed because John does that as well. And this updated chart I found very helpful. Okay, so this sort of thing in there, this is what other towns do. Acknowledging that just because other towns do it doesn't mean we do. No, but, I know. But it's good to have, I mean, it's know. nice to know that, that we're not the only town in the whole Commonwealth doing this. That's right. right. Okay, and give us some, you know, real concrete goals okay. that you can hit, again, just reiterating, more of an evolutionary pathway towards this, because I don't think we're ready to make the jump right now okay. to going wholly nonprofit. And you know, I think a big component of that, I, I was a, a big component, to a big component of this would be, you know, recruiting additional people in, right. and and elevating the involvement at the committee level, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And I think we're going to be, I think we'll be okay because, the bottom line is our our goals are all the same, right? But you know, we're not going to jump to this tonight clearly, and it's not the sort of thing like, like we tell other committees. Can you go away and give us? three more pieces of information and then we'll probably be able to prove it. I don't think we're there yet either. We need a pathway and a, and a plan to, to a roadmap to achieve these things mm -hmm. um, uh, first. That's, yeah, that's and, my and sense. And I think the other thing, to John's point, you said it's, it's still in its, its stage where it's finally up and going. Yeah. Well, let's see the demand go. Let's see, yeah. let's see the programming start. Let's see you know, more things being aired and then all of a sudden that's what should generate the interest from the town, not changing the corporation from this to that, I think. And and then you see people coming, and now there's 100 people saying, I want to be on a board, and then all of a sudden it's a much more compelling issue than mm -hmm. let's do it because other mm -hmm. towns are doing it. Start rolling. I mean, I, I know you're taping some of these other committees. Start rolling those things. Even if they're two months old, at least people are now going to be involved and say, hey, there's planning board out there. Hey, right. there's a – sorry, Nico. Hey, there's CONCOM. There's zoning. These are, you know, big, important boards. They're doing really big stuff. You get that out there, people are going to see the visible change. No, no one, right. the average citizen doesn't know there's a new studio yet, but they're going to see different and new stuff on Channel 10 like they already are. Yeah. You know, what you've done a really good step on forward, you know. Help bring it out from the back up, up forward. Anyway, thank you for yeah. hearing us out. We've and got I, it up oh, our chest. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you, you put a lot of time in this, so I don't want any of you walking away saying, oh, geez, we didn't get what we want. That's not necessarily that, true. I think it just... The thing that drove this not-for-profit part of it, quite frankly, because I was opposed to it originally when we first brought this up a year ago, but then I, when I started getting into it, with 80, over 80% 80 of the towns in Massachusetts are organized as not-for-profits. And I think largely it comes back to the fundraising and the liability issues. Uh, uh, Monty, there could be the some, some legal issues too with that when you're talking about, right. you know, First Amendment rights and other rights, you know, begin to deal with, you know, right. freedom of speech and everything. First Amendment. It may make sense. It may make sense. And we're not saying no, but I think the thought right now is okay, you know. Okay. Let's see. And then when Thank we you. come back to discuss the nonprofit at some point in time in the future, might be six months, might be 18 months, we really need to focus exclusively, I think, on the pros and cons and the liability issues and all this other stuff. But let's go through this budget process also. Get a budget together that allows you to run, I don't, I, allows you to do what you want to do. No, and that's the roadmap. I mean, I think we need, I, that's a fair request. I, I'm good at roadmaps. Thank you. All right. And Thank spreadsheets. You. Thank you for Thank coming you. in. I, Thank you. Tracy, thank stuff. you. Thank John, you. thank you. Rich Cathy, thank you. Okay, move on to uh, item number eight, which is a discussion of the liquor license violation policy. Um, this isn't going to be uh, too intense here, but. Um, we, took, we brought this up a couple of years ago. John and I have talked about it a lot and really haven't advanced it as far as I think we no, wanted to. Should. Yeah. Um, but we did have another violation that we'll be discussing s soon. And I just thought it was a good time for us to take a look at the policy in general um, <coughs> and get some sort of feedback. In the, in the upcoming weeks, we'll be dealing with another offense. And I'm going to put it on myself and probably with John's help. Um, Regather all that data that we got to to really propose. Just, just one point, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may, and, and Kim can verify this for me. This draft policy we have, ju June of '05. This was a, a, a uh, memo, I guess, that, as I remember, put together by a member of the board of selectmen, presented to the board. 
but never drafted as a policy or never it never even voted as a policy. I think we, uh, it, it was never voted. So I mean, not that it's not, we may very well use it, don't get me wrong. I'm just well, we saying, refer to it, so. As, we yeah. refer to it as a policy that was voted on or that we've adhered to. Right. And it's not, it was really a suggested policy back in 05. Yeah, it, it was, a, it sounds like it was a draft. It was never fully adopted. Exactly. And so we reference it in, in, with terms of talking. And I think, you know, uh, as you, as Joe knows and, and everybody else, what we as a board need to do is we need to adopt the policy so that anybody who's in violation will know straight up front, these are the violations, first, second, third, and these are what are the possible ramifications in the event that you are found to have violated the, uh, the liquor license policy. And I think, obviously, you're right. It, it has never been fully accepted nor adopted by the board. And um, I did go back and look at, I believe it or not, I pulled out the file I have on these. And so I'm like, we need to address yeah. it. I mean, right. I've got data from a bunch of different mm -hmm. towns as yep. well where, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's key things. I mean, again, this is 05, so it's already yep. seven years old. Um, you know, where there's a consistent format for other towns in terms of violations, people involved, and stuff like that. So, um, so I don't know. What would I you like to do? Why don't, why don't we start by, just, you know, at least saying that we're going to get together and, and bring it to the level that we wanted to. And then, is there any discussion on this in terms of um, violations or, or uh, feelings in terms of how this is, how this is, which is our guidelines? I think that's the word yep. we used in the past yep. um, for this. Mr. Murray. Um, first of all, thanks to you guys for, for picking this up and, and doing it because it's very, very important to have it. I think while we don't have any big issues going on in town, so we can, we can discuss and debate this just in the absolute, okay? Um, regarding the, the draft policy that was never adopted, I don't care if we start all over again and it's got nothing to do with this. It, may, it might bear no resemblance to this, it might bear partial resemblance to this, or it might be exactly this. I'd say just feel comfortable to you two to start over. You know, look at what other towns do, look at what the um, uh, sort of standard operating procedure is. I mean, a lot of this stuff makes a lot of good sense to me. I mean, I only say in passing, start all over, but you know what I mean? It's just whatever you gentlemen feel you want to bring forward to us, I really welcome the discussion and thank you for doing it. Um, because this is Im important stuff, and I do agree with what John just said about it's just very important so we have it codified. It'll make things easier for us. It'll make it easier for the people sitting at the table to understand what's going on as well. The, the, um, I went back and I looked at some of the materials we had had the last time we discussed this, and um, I was looking at the uh, licensing board from Fitchburg, which I thought was pretty apropos. Mm -hmm. um, first time offender, they, they would place a, a warning or um, a letter of warning plus there was a discretion of the board of uh, suspension one to three days. Second time offense, uh, same thing, uh, suspension one to four days, plus a change of operating hours, which I thought was really interesting. And instead of keeping it open, you'd say, fine, if second time offense, we'll restrict your hours of operation. Th uh, third time offense, uh, restriction of um, uh, changing operating hours, the same with license suspension, it goes up from you know, one to four to thir three to 14. Then the other thing they had was restrictions placed on the uh, license for occupancy numbers. So not only are you restricting the numbers, now you're gonna restrict the number of people who go in there, which I thought more or less that's probably more for restaurants, but I'm like another kind of um, innovative way. And then they had some other ones. The other thing, uh, my only other observation, and again, we, I think what we need to do is go back, talk about it, come back to the board and go from there. We have sale to minors with, with an ID or in sale to minors without an ID. Uh, given the past history of this town, I think it's irrelevant. Uh, sale to a minor, period. Whether you have an idea or you don't, it doesn't matter. It, it's a hard policy, and I think, to me, that might be the approach that we do, and then you have the first, second, and third offense or something. But I mean, I think, um, you know, we can go hard. Um, I think there has to be a little discretion sometimes with the board to take a look at if need be, but, you know, setting these guidelines up, it's gonna be great for anybody who has a liquor license who's selling, whether it's a restaurant or a store, to say, here it is. You know, you want to chance your liquor license. These are the ramifications. So uh, that's as, how I was looking at it. And as as we all know, the ABCC has the ultimate say. So we can, you know, we can put a, a ten day violation on it, and they can reverse it to three. But I don't know if they can do the other stuff that John you suggested there with the hours and the occupancy. I like. I think yeah. those are, are yeah. interesting. So why don't we commit to, to looking at this and getting back to the board, you know, 
after the new year. Yeah, that's fine. You may want to just one last. You may even want to check with the ABC and see if they have some sort of guidelines that they go by. As you just said, that's Tony, important. and you're absolutely right. We can get ten days, and it gets knocked down to one. So. <clears throat> And Chief Stewart, when I when I looked at this last time, he gave me some information as well, yep. so we can get him involved. That's a, a good idea, Joe. Okay. Um, moving on to item number <coughs> nine. A town treasurer for. Um, what are we doing here? A bond, bond anticipation. anticipation. This is Evening. real interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Um, but we did do very well uh, in the sale last week. Uh, the net interest cost, which factors in the premium that the town received, the rate was um, less than half a percent. Um, I have it here. 0.4236. So um, I need you to vote as directed by the information that I, Kim would have provided. Um, I got the vote from Vaughn Council and um, sign all the documents at the end of the meeting if you haven't. Um, do I need to actually read every word? Yes. Okay, you do. Sometimes we have, sometimes we have. And I, I just want to ask two quick questions before you do that. Um, first, why uh, why do we get a premium? Why do we actually it's get thirty nine thousand dollars as opposed <coughs> to just paying less in interest? It's actually an option um, where I was a treasurer collector before. I think I only did a premium once. Um, it's the way historically working with the fiscal advisor, uh, who's a different firm, a different person than I worked with before. Um, they put it in there. It covers all our issuance costs, which can get quite expensive. Uh, not as much for a bond anticipation note, but for a regular long-term bond, it's very, very expensive. So um, that covers all those costs for us. Okay. Otherwise, I'd have to factor it in to all the individuals, so to do a you know pro rata um, calculation for all the different projects and take it out of what I've borrowed for them. Um, and you had a second question. That makes sense. Well, what's the what is this? What is this note for? Um, it's for items. several different items um, that you should have in your packet as well. Um, most of which are from the capital budget that was voted at the annual town meeting in April. And then I added um, an old item from 1997. There was a little bit of an authorization left on an I&I um, &I sewer um, town meeting authorization. So we're just cleaning that up to borrow to the capacity on that article. It's only, um, it was 16145 16, and then another old article from 2008 where um, doing a borrowing against that sort of to um, borrow to the capacity on that one because we hadn't before. Um, and then a meter replacement that was a, um, because I work with all the department heads throughout the year to see what projects they have with the outstanding authorizations authorized but not issued yet into long term. And if they're not ready to do the project, then I don't want to borrow the money. So um, they are ready to do the $200,000 meter replacement project from 2009. And then there was another I&I &I, um, item from 2010, and the rest is maybe about 10 uh, from 2011. Right. Yeah, we just didn't get that. So in, in the future, if we can just get the piece of paper that says a breakdown of the $2 million. Oh, I thought I forwarded uh, yes. everything, but I certainly have that. And the total is uh, $2.1 um, before I read this, I just want to make sure, because this was in our packet Friday, is this the very latest down to the proper penny? I don't want to read the wrong dollar value. Or Has anything changed in the last three days or anything like that? No, because we sold it last week. Okay, so great. that's the paperwork from Bond Council. Sure, okay. So I'll move that the Board of Selectmen vote to support the bond anticipation notes as presented by the Treasury Collector and as read by the clerk into the record. Second. Second by Mr. Norton. So now I read it and then we Take vote it. Take it away. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is a uh, little over one page, folks, so please bear with me. I, the Clerk of the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Situate, Massachusetts, certify that a meeting of the Board held November 15th, 2011, of which meeting all members of the Board were duly notified and at which a quorum was present. The following votes were unanimously passed, all of which appear upon the official record of the Board in my custody. Voted to approve the sale of $2,186,479, 1.75% general obligation bond anticipation notes, the notes, 
of the town dated November 18th, 2011 and payable November 16th, 2012 to Jeffries and Company Incorporated at par and accrued interest plus a premium of $28,841. Further voted that in connection with the marketing and sales of the notes, the preparation and distribution of a revised notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated October 27th, 2011 and a final official statement dated November 8th, 2011, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be and hereby are ratified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Further voted that the consent to the financial advisor bidding for the notes as executed prior to the bidding for the notes is hereby confirmed. Further, noted, further voted that the town treasurer and the board of selectmen be and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a significant events disclosure undertaking in compliance with SEC Rule 15C2-12 in such form as may be approved by bond council to the town, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the notes for the benefit of the holders of the notes from time to time. Further voted that each member of the Board of Selectmen, the Town Clerk, and the Town Treasurer be and hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificates, receipts, or other documents as may be determined by them or any of them to be necessary or convenient to carry into effect the provisions of the foregoing votes. I further certify that the agenda for the meeting, a copy of which is attached here to, was posted on the bulletin boards of the town at least 24 hours before the meeting in compliance with section 7-11A of the town charter. I further certify that the votes were taken at a meeting open to the public, that no vote was taken by secret ballot, that a notice stating the plate, place, date, time, and agenda for the meeting, which agenda included the adoption of the above votes, was filed with the town clerk and a copy thereof posted in the manner conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that the office of the town clerk is located or, if applicable, in accordance with an alternative method of notice prescribed or approved by the Attorney General as set forth in 940 CMR 29.03 to be at least 48 hours, not including Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays prior to the time of the meeting and remained so posted at the time of the meeting that no deliberations or decision in connection with the sale of the notes were taken in executive session, all in accordance with General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18-25 as amended, dated November 15, 2011, and signed by the Clerk of the Board of Selectmen, Richard W. Murray, Town of Situates. Thank you, Rick. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane, Trisha, Kim, for <coughs> getting this together. Uh, I need to sign that tonight, correct? Um, moving on to item number 10, which is the uh, um, <clears throat> recommending that uh, Michael Collins from the Housing Authority be appointed to the CPC committee. Move that the Board of Selectmen appoint Michael Collins as the Housing Authority's representative on the Community Preservation Act committee. Second. Second by Mr. Norton for the discussion. I know Mike does a great job on this stuff. So That's a great job. Good guy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous. <clears throat> item number 11. This is a, a request for proposal for the sale of uh, land on the driftway. Um, just a, a quick summary. Um, the board has been talking about this for a number of months, and uh, we see that there's an opportunity here. A group has come before us and presented a, a project that we thought was uh, innovative and, and um, interesting for the town. Um, um, we have uh, looked at the designs, looked at the, the use of the space, and uh, decided amongst us that this is a good way for us to um, um, grow the town and, uh, and um, support the economy and really try and um, establish the uh, um, business and educational district as well as keeping with our maritime history. Um, so what we've done is we've asked Trish to, to move forward and, and draw up uh, an RFP as the law um, says that we need to to uh, make this uh, um, available to other situations that may be able to maybe want to go under this uh, um, RFP as well and utilize this land for these needs. So uh, under our um, request, she's put this RFP together and um, give it before us. I know we've all taken the time to read it. And uh, in general, if for those that don't know what it is, it's, it's for um, a campus for, is there a, yeah, the development of an environmental and maritime studies campus on the property on the driftway between the um, transfer station and Widow's Walk Golf Course. Um, the, the total acreage was, what is it, like, mm, what's the 
something small actually. Ten. Ten acres. Ten acres of land over there. So that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Um, we've got the document in front of us, um, and I open it up for a discussion for the board. Yeah. Mr. Norton. As you said, Mr. Chairman, this has been discussed not only by us, but by the, uh, the group of individuals who have spent a lot of time uh, working on this idea that they had. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think the proposal, the request for proposals is, is good. I think it, it it's certainly covers every aspect of the law, and I support setting it out. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the RFP or the request for proposals speaks for itself. But I mean, it's, it's basically the town trying to uh, put together an environmental and marine studies campus. The town's willing to uh, entertain proposals for people who want to go and build on this site. The, um, obviously, the town intends to sell the property at a nominal consideration, but it's going to have to be built by whoever decides to uh, bid on it. And in the event that they fail to build it within a specified period of time, the property comes back to the town. Uh, this is an opportunity for the town to augment um, a new use, in this case an educational use that could actually help the town put it on the driftway and, and, and expand um, other businesses and, and students and people who want to live here in situate. It's going to be um, avant-garde to the extent that it's a 21st century type of facilities or campus. It's opened up to a number of institutions and those institutions are the ones that are expected to bid on the process and um, we anticipate having all the bids in by December 20th, 2011. One caveat that everybody should understand is, is that even though they bid on this, it still has to be approved at town meeting. <laughs> this is not a foregone conclusion. In the event that people in town decide to come out uh, in April, they can come out, come out and say, no, we don't want to do this. However, it's a question of whether you do this first or whether you first do the uh, town approval. In this sense, the board determined that it would be better to put out a request for a proposal to see if there's any interest. And if there is, then they're going to meet their criteria that we, the town, have put forward. And this is what this document uh, puts forward. So uh, I, I commend everybody involved. I commend the uh, uh, town administrator and uh, people who, who went to great lengths to put this RFP together. And you know, the board has worked very hard to try to achieve something that's unique uh, to the town of Situate, not just to the town of Situate, but frankly, probably to the South Shore as well as to Eastern uh, Massachusetts. So. Um, hopefully good things are going to come of it and we look forward to the bids and I do at least so thank and, you and as John mentioned um, there's really no commitment from the town unless we get a proposal that we um, find is acceptable and meets our criteria so um, you know at this point we'll put it out and see what sort of bids come in and then evaluate them as that if that occurs the only thing I have to add is as what John mentioned is I really thank the town administrator and uh, everybody that's been involved in this getting this RFP out there's a lot of subtleties in here that protect the town as throughout this entire process as John mentioned um, you know if if uh, despite best intentions nothing ends up being done over a certain number of years then the land reverts back to the town but there's also some other things that we're anticipating that that all the responders um, would be able to address uh, regarding education of situate persons um, and, and so on. We're a coastal ocean community. It's always good to have education. This is going to potentially create jobs. It's going to bring more people into town. Um, I hope the process continues moving forward as well as it has. And let's, let's get this out there and see how many people uh, hopefully respond. I, yes. just, I just want to say a few things. Um, to follow up on what the board said and to clarify for folks at home that may be watching and the, the reporters in the room. Um, the board, as you know, had several discussions with an informal group that exists that would has an idea or, um, for a project of this nature. Um, and the board had sort of been discussing that informally, but we had several meetings in executive session because um, the board is allowed to go <coughs> into executive session to negotiate and determine the strategy for the sale of town-owned land. And one of the big issues discussed around that before the board ultimately decided to issue this RFP is um, what we would expect back as a town before the town would consider to even award the bid to any successful proposal, to any proposer to make sure the interests of the town um, were um, secured. And um, 
the best representation of the use of that land. So I just want to take a second to highlight one or two of the things. Um, even though educational institutions are exempt from local zoning bylaws, this RFP requires any successful proposal to go through a full site plan review process with the planning board. Um, payments in lieu of taxes, as again, with an educational institution being tax exempt, there's a criteria in the RFP that requires um, payments in lieu of taxes as part of the proposal for the value of the municipal services that would be provided by the town. Um, there's time frames built in within the RFP, so if substantive progress is not made by any uh, agreement we enter into with a successful responder, the land would revert back to the town. Um, some other requirements include use of the facilities by town residents and also that the project design be LEED certified. Um, there's other things that are included in that that I'm not going to go into, but um, this has been um, contemplated by the board in terms of ensuring that the town's interests would be met if we had respondents. And as the board members have said, there is no onus on the town to even award a bid to any proposer if we do get proposals. And it's all dependent on town meeting approving the terms of any lease um, at hopefully an annual town meeting if they feel they can go forward. So I just want to point a couple of those things out since it might seem like this big thing tonight. And actually, um, there's been a lot of work done and in accordance with the statute to negotiate um, the best interest of sale of town land. Thank you, Trish, for bringing out all those details. It's a very, very well, very detailed document, and it, it goes, what's the next step? It goes in the uh, central register, in the central register um, for several two weeks. So it should be available um, by late tomorrow. It will be posted on our website, and then it will be published in the central register November 29th, all things being equal. Great. So it will be on our website as well as the central register? Yes. Okay. We have a new... Um, Cool. link on our website that lists all available bids and proposals. Well, that's interesting. Is there a suggested motion for this? Um, I would just Go move ahead. that the board approve the RFP as presented and proceed with um, advertising. So moved. Well, let's um, move the board selectman vote to approve the issuance of a request for proposal for sale of land off the driftway in situate. Second. Second one is Danny. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> right. Moving on to item number 12. Um, uh, it, it's been in the paper lately um, regarding the redistricting, that the uh, congressional redistricting that's been going on, and we just wanted to take a second to make that announcement here. Um, we heard from uh, uh, Representative Cantwell this evening and um, the lines that they drew in the paper earlier um, in the week are they going to be the finalized lines in situ will be moving up to district eight um, and we look forward to working with uh, um, representative uh, congressman lynch and um and uh, you know moving forward in building that relationship uh, he's a senior um, representative or a congressman and uh, um, we're hoping that he'll help us as much as the uh, the ones in the past have done just one one one, one observation is that um, look forward to working with congressman lynch we're very fortunate uh, ten year uh, veteran of, of Congress uh, and I, I would like to think the board would uh, send a letter of, of um, uh, encouragement and thankfulness and and hopefully invite him or uh, his uh, senior staff member to come down at, at a time that's convenient uh, to visit with the board um, you know, to introduce ourselves and and thank him for being our representative it's a great idea great good okay. moving on to uh, so Kim will you drop that letter yes, thank you uh, moving on to item 12A, <coughs> um, this is a, um, we've had some requests for banners um, on Front Street and on, uh, on other roads in town, um, so we thought we'd just put it on the, on the agenda for some <coughs> discussion purposes. Um, I, I, I've spoken with Tricia about this, and, and right now the town has no policy for any sort of banners going up, and uh, she's familiar with this, having made uh, some policies in is it Hadley or whatever? So uh, what she's going to do at the request of the board is to um, get a policy before us so that we can um, enact it so that when people want to put up a banner somewhere in town that there'll be a document that we can turn to. And um, 
and we have it. And we have it. What I would say is, would we be able to like postpone it for maybe um, next meeting or the meeting after? The yeah, I didn't think we we're going to discuss the policy. Did we? Did you get it, it done this afternoon? Good. And then uh, we'll take a look at it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's great for the town to be able to have a, uh, a single point where people can take a look when they're driving and, and say, you know, this is an event that's coming up, or you know, it's a good promotion. It's good for the town, so you kind of know what's going on. And um, uh, but I think we need a policy to take a look at. So I, I'd only ask that maybe we yeah, postpone I didn't it. Yeah, I have Do we? Oh, you know, okay. I for another just, meeting. I, I, my point was going to be, it doesn't seem that complicated. Let's vote it tonight, but if you want to post it, we'll it. Yeah, it's I haven't even read you. it. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay. um, I mean, it's a banner I'm policy. I've seen it, it's not Tony. I know Rick <laughs> and John have seen it, right? And Joe. Okay. Well, my. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we do this? Why, we'll, we'll, <laughs> could we postpone it till um, next meeting? Next meeting. I mean, do you even have to, I guess we should accept it in a formal meeting, so. Yeah, why don't we just put it on the next okay. agenda and then go from there. Um, next item is other business. Um, None. I, I just have two. Um, I wanted to s commend um, the DPW for auctioning off or putting bids in on various equipment that they had to try to sell, and they did it. Some of them were in the back. My understanding, it was the most the town has raised. They even outbid their Pier 44, whoever ran that one. And uh, I just wanted to commend okay. commend them for doing that. Um, the other thing was um, just I received a letter from um, somebody in the neighborhood who was requesting signs. And maybe I should forward this on to the uh, traffic rules and regulations. Um, signs for, like, um, children, slow down type of thing. And I know that's a cost. but. It's not just in this neighborhood. It could be in any of the neighborhoods. It's just they're hoping to put up signs to, like, hopefully prevent an accident. So if I could forward that on to somebody, that, those are the only two things I had. Uh, oh, there is another one. There is um, Thursday night, there is a, a Chamber of Commerce is having a recognition or awards banquet. And um, I'd certainly encourage anybody who's interested. It's at the Barker Tavern. It starts at 530. It will go from 5 to 9. And the various people who are going to be, or entities, business entities, are going to be receiving it. Uh, one of which is our board member, uh, Joseph Norton, who's going to be receiving the Chick Gates Lifetime Achievement Awards. So uh, uh, commend Joe as well as uh, three other uh, recipients, and I'll certainly share that with, with other people at our next meeting. But um, Another one's in the audience. Uh, well? Nico Afonseco with, uh, uh, with his business, and so we, we commend him, and, and uh, Jay Cole from Rivas, as well as um, uh, Elaine Bongazon with Conway, Jack Conway. So in any event. Please come if you Thursday can. Thursday night at the Barker. Mr. Murray? Uh, I don't have anything, but Mr. Harris is absent tonight, and he asked us to see something, so I'm just going to sit over here on behalf of Mr. Harris. I can't do him justice. But anyways, um, as you all know, Sean spends a lot of time working with DPW and checking up on things like that in town, and, and he was very impressed. Um, he, he was actually visiting a location on, on Maple Street where they were replacing the water stand pipe. And he just wanted it to be really publicly acknowledged about the excellent work that Jim DeBarros and the other folks out there working on it. Um, Sean, the, the, the quote is, I visited the tank and when it was being cleaned, and I was extremely impressed with the professionalism that these, these gentlemen um, put in there. And he knew the tank hadn't been cleaned in 23 years. And, and the, uh, the quality of the work that Jim and those guys did was just above, way above the bar, and he just wanted to draw attention to them. And... Uh, Sean does a great job on that, and uh, it's good for him to bring that up and extend our thanks to Jim and Al and those folks. And that's it for me, and that Murray guy doesn't have any either. Thanks, Sean. Um, while we're on the DPW uh, bandwagon, I want to thank them for putting that electronics day together last weekend. Um, there was a pretty good turnout. Um, Al's not here to give the numbers, but if you went to the dump and you wanted to get rid of electronic stuff or televisions or whatever, there was a big uh, truck there with a guy willing to help you lift your stuff in the back and get it away for free or at an extreme discount. Um, on top of that, just a few other, uh, first I'll do the sports report. I um, want to uh, congratulate the sixth grade um, football team. They made it to the Super Bowl last weekend and played a great game. Came up a little bit short in an eight to nothing game, but they've had a great year and made it to the Super Bowl two years in a row. Good job to them. Um, <coughs> additionally, the cheerleading squads from the sixth and eighth grade went in a regional competition at the Reggie Lewis Center 
and both of our teams won first place in their divisions. Um, and this was a huge undertaking. I was there, um, and they were one of the loudest venues I've ever been to. And, uh, and both of the teams did excellently in, in like I said, winning their divisions. Um, two other quick things. A Santa Stroll every year. It's been a uh, um, kind of a town event for, I don't know, 20 years or so at least. Um, it is on December 3rd. Uh, Santa typically gets in a boat and comes into the harbor. Um, and uh, so mark that down in your cal calendars for December 3rd. And lastly, this holiday season, we encourage all of you, uh, all 10 of you watching, um, to shop locally. Um, the, the vendors uh, and the stores and the, and the merchants in town have great deals, great products available. Um, the first Friday, there's a big thing that goes on down on Front Street where all of the stores are open late and, and have different um, festive things going on. So I, I encourage you to go out, shop locally, and, and starting on first Friday, which I think is December 2nd, maybe, um, is a Friday. So that's all I have. And don't forget going to North Situate, too. Yes, North Situate as well. Um, locally is all over. Um, great. Um, why don't we move on to correspondence? None. None? Good. And uh, item number 15, we are going to move into executive session to talk about union and non-union co collective bargaining issues. So, and we will not be coming back into open session. Excuse me? Oh, right. Oh, should we do the minutes after? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. After. So we will come back in this open session to do the minutes um, later. So. Mr. Martin? Aye. Yes. 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 Good night, folks. Thank you all for coming. Have a good night.